Hey, Stat students, how you doing? Today we're going to be talking about gathering data, and in particular we're talking about sampling and bias. Sampling, that's what we're going to be doing. Bias, that's what we're going to be avoiding. Okay? So, first off, let's look at what we're doing. We have a population. Now this is going to be a review. We talked about this at the very beginning of the course. We got this population, and the population has certain characteristics, okay? You can measure the mean, you can measure the standard deviation, you can measure the variance of you know, some feature. Let's say we're wanting to know the uh, average uh, body temperature of dogs. Okay? So one way we could find out these, uh, <clears throat> these parameters is by taking a census. We all know about that, right? Okay? You go find every single dog in the world and you measure their uh, body temperature, and then you get these, these parameters, all right? Uh, not convenient at all to do. What's much more convenient is to take this little piece of the population, the piece that we call a sample, okay? And then you take the exact same measurements of that, and what you get are statistics. So again, this, this is review. Parameters describe populations. Statistics describe samples. Generally, with parameters, we'll use uh, Greek letters, and with statistics, we use uh, re regular uh, Latin, Roman letters, okay? Uh, so, uh, it's important to remember that statistics, that's what we get, are estimates of the parameters. That's what we're actually looking for, what we want, all right? So, <clears throat> what can go wrong? You can get bias. Bias is bad. Why is bias bad? It's because if you have a biased sample, or if you do a biased measurement, what you're measuring is not what you're trying to measure, okay? Bias is a systematic mismeasurement, all right? So let's look at uh, 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 types of bias that we might get. Uh, we might get undercoverage, okay? What is undercoverage? Undercoverage is when your sampling frame does not equal the population. There's a big difference between the sampling frame and the population. Which brings up the question, what's a sampling frame? A sampling frame is the part of the population from which the sample might be drawn. Okay? Uh, now, and you, you might be thinking, well, that's just the entire population. Well, not necessarily. And uh, there's a really, really famous example of undercoverage, uh, and that is uh, a, uh, um, that's the case of the Literary Digest. The Literary Digest was a magazine that existed back in the uh, early part of the 20th century, and one of the things that the Literary Digest was famous for was calling presidential elections, okay? And in particular, in 1936, they called the election, they were, they were predicting the election, and this was between uh, FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, and Alf Landon, the Republican candidate. And uh, what the Literary Digest did was they, they, uh, uh, took a, a huge sample, like millions, uh, of magazine subscribers, uh, of their magazine. Uh, they looked through car registration records, and they also looked through telephone records, and got all these people and, uh, and asked them who would win the election. And what they found was they predicted that Alf Landon would win the election in a, uh, in a huge landslide, which is how we got uh, our president, Alf Landon, right? Hmm. Except that's not what happened at all. And the problem that they had was under coverage. Their sampling frame was people who had magazine subscriptions, cars, or telephones. Which, in 1936, the middle of the Depression, meant affluent people. So their sampling frame did not look like their population at all. It was a, it was a, a, a subset of the population, and worse than that, it was a subset that did not represent the population very well at all. So this was a, an extremely famous case, and actually it was kind of the downfall of the Literary Digest. They went out of business shortly afterwards. Uh, it was, however, an opportunity for a very young pollster to make a name for himself, this guy named George Gallup, because Mr. Gallup was able to not only... He, he took a much smaller sample, but it was a well-selected sample, and not only was he able to uh, uh, correct the, liter the Literary Digest at the time and say, uh, I'm going to pick Roosevelt instead of Landon, but he accurately uh, 
he accurately predicted what the Literary Digest would say. So he, he got kind of cocky there. But made, for, made a name for himself, and uh, the Gout Poll is really one of the famous, the, the most famous polls in existence today. So, that's what under, under coverage is. When your sampling frame is not your population, and it doesn't even look like your population. Okay? There's also non-response bias. Now, non-response bias is similar to under coverage in that uh, you ignore a piece of the population that you shouldn't ignore, except this time it's somewhat voluntary. Okay? This time you've tried, you tried to include uh, a particular population, but they chose not to respond. Okay? Now, I say you tried to include. Non-response bias means you kind of didn't try hard enough. Maybe they were hard to find, you didn't have uh, addresses for them when you sent out this uh, uh, um, uh, poll in the mail, or you, uh, you know, for some reason, you didn't get this group of people to respond to you. Just like under coverage, you're now ignoring a piece of your population, and you're going to get results that don't measure the entire population, but instead measure just one little subset of that pop population, which may or may not look like the whole population. So non-response bias, n under coverage, both uh, things you want to avoid. And then there's also voluntary response bias. What is voluntary response bias? Voluntary response bias is when you choose somebody who's going, pick me, pick me, okay? Uh, you can't let people self-select or, or anything self-select to be in your sample. There has to be randomness which chooses your sample, not people volunteering. Uh, and, uh, well, here's a good example of voluntary response bias. Uh, several years ago, Ann Landers had a column that uh, portrayed uh, parenting really, really negatively, and, uh, and then she said, she opened things up to her readers and said, well, what do you think? Well, people wrote back and overwhelmingly said that if they could do it again, they wouldn't have kids, which is a horrible thing to say. And the majority were saying this. Well, this is not what people think in real life. In real life, the vast majority of people who have had kids are very happy to have had children, and they find it very fulfilling, and yada, yada. Okay, but, uh, so, so anyway, it's because of the way that uh, 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 she asked the question. Actually, I'm going to get to that in a second. That's called response bias. But it's also because she said, those of you who want to answer, go ahead and answer. Okay? Not good. Now we get to response bias. Okay? Now the piece of that last story that included response bias is the part that kind of primed the answer. Okay? Uh, Ann Landers was kind of bashing parenthood. She got a, uh, she got a, a letter from somebody else that was saying, oh, you know, I'm just... I'm at home changing diapers, and my parent, my, my friends get to go out, and whoa. So, uh, that sets up a negative reaction, okay? If I go over to somebody, and uh, if I take a survey of people about whether, they're, whether uh, cigarette smoking should be allowed in bars, and the whole time I'm taking the survey, I'm puffing away on a cigarette, you think they're going to respond? maybe a little differently, given the fact that I'm smoking a cigarette while I'm asking the question? I think they will. That's what response bias is. Okay, so, how do you avoid, how do you avoid getting bias? Well, one way is to be very methodical and very careful before you start sampling, okay? And uh, in order to do that, you should ask yourself some questions. Questions like, what exactly is my population of interest? Uh, am I... Am I wondering uh, what the uh, opinion about, uh, let, let's say I, I'm polling a bunch of people about uh, uh, the availability of abortion in Texas, okay? Something of a hot topic right now. Uh, so, I'm, first of all, I have to ask myself, do I want to know about uh, people's opinions who are voters? Or do I want to know everyone's opinion? Do I just want to know the adults? Do I just want to know the women or just the men? Uh, it's very, very important that you figure out exactly what, what am I measuring? What population am I looking at? Okay? So get that question answered. And then after that, exactly what parameter do you want to measure? Are you measuring their, uh, their answer to this one particular question? Are you measuring uh, uh, the answer to are you going to vote like this in the future? Uh, exactly what parameter is is it that you're trying to measure? Uh, then, 
what's going to be my sampling frame? And as we saw with under coverage, this can be very, very tricky. Uh, how am I going to get my people? All right? Uh, am I going to um, am I going to use phone books? Because uh, in this day and age, that's actually becoming problematic because more and more people use cell phones. Uh, or am I going to use uh, voter registration records? You know, exactly how am I going to get my uh, uh, my sampling frame? And then, uh, how big is my sample going to be? How much money do I have? Okay, because that how much money, how much time do I have? Uh, that's something that you want to keep in mind about. You know, how how uh, how many people are you actually going to sample? Uh, and then, what sampling design will I use? So, when I'm looking at sampling designs, there's four well uh, well regarded sampling methods uh, that statisticians generally consider these to be kind of the best sampling methods. Okay, one is a simple random sample. Another one's a stratified random sample. Another one's a cluster sample, and another one is a systematic sample. Now, there's also uh, samples called multi-stage samples that are basically combinations of, of these four. You, know, you, might do, uh, you might do a stratified random sample and then underneath, well, inside of that, do a cluster sample. But uh, we'll get to that later. All right? So, first off, let's look at each of these four. First off, the simple random sample. Here's a population. What a simple random sample is, let's say I'm going to take a sample of five people from this population. What a simple random sample is, I could take these five here, or perhaps I could take uh, these five here. A simple random sample means that I could, th that, that every possible combination of five people is equally likely to be chosen. Okay? Now, think about what that means. It doesn't say every person in here is equally likely to be chosen. It says every possible combination of five people is equally likely to be chosen. Right? That's what a simple random sample is. Now, what's the pro of a simple random sample? Well, the, the best thing about a simple random sample is it's what we base all of our statistical analysis on in the future. So, you want to get as close to that as possible. What's the bad thing about a simple random sample? It's hard. It's really hard to do. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really, really difficult to randomly go out and, and, and poll all these different people. So, uh, so next one we're going to look at is, uh, oops, there's one more uh, group there. Uh, next one we're going to look at is a stratified random sample. Now, what a stratified random sample does is you have two strata of your population, okay? Or, or perhaps three or perhaps four. Uh, strata of your population. And what these are is they are they're chunks of the population that are different from one from one another in some way. Okay? So if I were doing a stratified random sample, I would look at this and I'd say, well let's see, I think about 40% are in this group here and about 60% are in this group here. So if I'm going to take a sample of five, I'm going to make sure that I get two down here and then I'm going to make sure that I get three up here. So that way each of my strata are well represented. All right. Uh, sometimes you want to, when you're when you're taking a sample, you want to make sure that you get the same number of men as women, the same number of men as you do women. Or if I were taking a sample of uh, students, I might want to make sure that I get, you know, a certain number of seniors, juniors, sophomores, freshmen, to make sure that every class is well re represented. Okay. Now, why is this not a simple random sample? Well, because even though everybody has a chance of being selected, uh, and everybody, I would say, has an equal chance of being selected, I can't grab five people from here, or five people from here. No. The stratified random sample specifically keeps me from doing that. It says, no, 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 no. You can't just grab people from this group, or just grab people from this group. It has to be proportionally uh, representative of the, uh, of the population. So. What's good about the uh, uh, stratified random sample? Well, what's good about it is uh, you're not going to get a weirdo sample. Okay, you're going to get a sample that, at least according to, uh, at least with with these strata, uh, it represents the population well. What's bad about it? Again, it's kind of get kind of difficult to do because what you're doing is you're now doing two simple random samples, uh, and uh, well, it's like I said, it's 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 still difficult. So now. Let's look, at the, uh, let's look at the cluster sample. So again, what we do is, we take our population and we break it up into groups, except our groups are different this time. 
This time what we're doing is we're breaking them into groups. Each one of them is uh, heterogeneous and relatively uh, representative of the population. Okay? So uh, let's go back for a second. Uh, back. Hey, wrong way. There we go. Okay. So back in our, with our, uh, our, our stratified random sample, these groups are not heterogeneous. Okay? These groups are homogeneous in some way. Either they're all the same gender, or they're all the same race, or they're all the same more or less age, something like that, where this group is really different from this group. All right? Now, with the cluster sample, that is simply not the case. This cluster is similar to this cluster, is similar to this cluster, is similar to this cluster. Really, any of these clusters are fairly, are fairly representative of the entire population. So what I can do is, instead of taking a simple random sample of the entire population, I take a simple random sample of the clusters themselves. And then, I just grab everybody in that cluster. Or perhaps, everybody in this cluster. Okay? Uh, or perhaps, everybody in this cluster. Alright? So, first you take a simple random sample of the clusters, then you just do a census of that cluster. Now, um, pros and cons of cluster sampling. Uh, pro, it's a lot easier. Now we're starting to get to a, uh, to a sampling method that you might actually be able to do, that you, that's uh, uh, not uh, prohibitively difficult. Uh, con, well, maybe they're not quite as representative as, uh, representative as I think they are. Okay, if I were doing a, uh, um, if I were trying to figure out uh, what high school students think of the drinking age, let's say, well, that's a bad idea. Uh, if I were thinking what college students think of the drinking age, um, well, I might take all the different colleges in Texas and say, those are going to be my clusters. And so once I randomly select a college, I'm going to go in and ask everybody there. Well, maybe... Baylor and Rice think differently. Maybe UT and A&M think differently. Maybe, maybe just one college is not going to be representative of the entire state. So you got to be very careful with cluster sampling. All right? Uh, so this brings us to our last uh, sampling type, which is systematic sampling. Okay? This is a fairly common one also. It's, uh, uh, um, you, you've, you've seen this happen before. What you do with systematic sampling is, first off, you randomly select your first, uh, uh, the, the first one in your sample. Well, no, that's not true. First off, you put everybody in order, okay? So that's, what these, that's what's happened here. No longer are they just in this big population. We've now taken them and we've lined them up, all right? Then you randomly select our first partic uh, participant, which is that one right there, okay? And then after that, you choose the nth person afterwards. Now, what is n? It's whatever you select it to be beforehand. Okay? Beforehand. Not afterwards. Because you don't want your judgment getting involved here. You want this to be as random as possible. Uh, so, uh, um, so there's, my, uh, there's my first person. Then afterwards, I'm going to choose every 16th person. So we go along here. We count the 16th person. There they are, and then we count to the 16th person again, there's the next one, and then we count to the 16th person again, and there's that next one, and then there's the next one after that. And that would be my sample of, uh, of five individuals from this population, okay? I randomly select the first one, and then after that it's the nth person afterwards, okay? You see this a lot at, uh, uh, at uh, um, exit polls after elections. Uh, I've seen this coming out of voting. I'll see somebody standing off to the side, and I remember when I didn't understand what a systematic sample was, I got kind of irritated that they didn't ask me. You know, I wanted my voice to be heard in this uh, exit poll, and I stood there for a while waiting for them to choose me. Well, they didn't choose me because I wasn't the nth person. I wasn't the right one to come out. They waited until they got to the right person, and they said, there it is, and then they went over and asked that person. Okay, so that's what a systematic sample is. So what you have is you have a, a simple random sample, uh, you have a, a, a stratified random sample, cluster sample, and systematic sample. All four of those are good ways of, uh, of sampling your population. Now remember, all of them are random. All of them have to have some random element. 
When you're doing a simple random sample, that means random. That means you're rolling a die, you're flipping a coin, you're using, you're not doing this. You're using a random number generator, okay? And you are totally randomly, not using your own judgment, completely randomly choosing those participants. Uh, and that's every good sampling method has to have a random element involved. All right? Now, let's look at some, uh, some samples that are notoriously biased. First off, the voluntary response sample, okay? The voluntary response sample is, that's when uh, uh, the, the person on, on the news, they, uh, uh, they ask people to call in and say, give us your opinion about so-and-so. Those things are terrible, all right? It, it's just a horrible way, and they'll even say, well, it's non-scientific. It's not just non-scientific, it's bad, okay? Because the people who generally respond are the angry people or the people who just really have strong feelings. But for most of us who have nuanced feelings or complex feelings or perhaps just kind of neutral feelings, we don't bother calling in because it's not worth it to us. So what you get is you get this strange sample of really overpassionate people that do not represent the, the population at large. So voluntary response samples, bad stuff. Convenience sample, Oh, please. All right? This is the, this is the sample uh, that you get when you stand in a mall and you just you look expectantly and you say, oh, oh, would you like to take a survey? Okay? Terrible. Because generally who they ask are people whose eyes they catch and uh, people who look kind of friendly. Because they're not going to go over and ask somebody who, you know, is going to react badly to them because they don't want the neg negative experience. So uh, a convenient sample is actually a lot like a voluntary response sample because generally they choose people who are going to voluntarily respond. Uh, and again, for the same reasons, you just, you just, it, it doesn't work, right? Uh, any sample based on your or someone else's judgment should be thrown out, okay? Anytime you look across an audience and you say, Oh, what's a what, what's a good representative group? I think uh, this one and this one and this one. There are things going on in your head that are making you choose those people. Don't do it. All right. Roll a die, flip a coin, take a uh, random number generator. Don't use your own judgment. You're sorry to tell you this. Your judgment is bad. All right. So, don't use any of these methods. So you can use simple random sample. You can use the uh, uh, stratified sample, you can use the, uh, the, the cluster sample, you can use your systematic sample, all of those work really well. Uh, voluntary response samples, don't use them. Uh, uh, convenient samples, don't use them. Any judgment samples, anything having to do with your judgment, do not use it at all. Now, it could be that you, you know, you, you'll, uh, you'll, you'll take a sample, you'll do an experiment, and you'll take a, or you'll, you'll take a survey, and you'll use a, a sampling method, Somebody else does the same survey, and they use a, a, a good sampling method, and y'all come up with different outcomes, okay? You, you, your response variable that you're measuring uh, is different from one sample to the next. Should you then look at each other and say, ah, you don't know what you're doing? No, you shouldn't, because no matter what your design, you're always going to have sampling variability. That is to say, your results are going to depend entirely on the sample that you chose. Maybe you got a weird sample. Maybe your friend got a weird sample. Maybe you got a sample that's just like slightly weird, okay? You never know. However, if you use one of these methods, and if your sample is sufficiently large, it's really, really unlikely that your sample is going to not be representative of the population at large, okay? It's extremely unlikely that your, that your sample will not represent your population fairly well. And that's what's good about this stuff, okay? Now, next video is going to be experiments and observational studies. That's going to be the third video in our series of uh, gathering data. And so, I uh, guess I'll see you then.